All right, let's get started a bit early so we have more time for questions after. So my name is Otto. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur and Scala developer. I have been using Scala for the past four years. Before that, I was mainly using Java, C++, the usual stuff. Uh, I come from Finland. And uh, in, my, in my company, we have been using Scala, like I said, for four years. This is over from Java. And there's no going back to Java after you try Scala, as you probably know. <laughs> for the past one year, I've been also involved in the Scala.js. So we used to do our front end in JavaScript, as most people do. But now we've switched over to Scala.js because it saves us the trouble of doing any JavaScript development. And I've also been quite active in the Scala.js community, building some libraries, doing tutorials, also revamping the whole Scala.js uh, website. So it's, it's really great technology, and I, I hope you'll find it useful after, after this presentation. So what is Scala.js? It's basically a compiler. You write Scala, just like you would normally, and then you compile it to JavaScript, which you can then run in the browser. It has full support of the Scala language because it's actually using the same Scala compiler as you would use when compiling JVM. It just outputs instead of bytecode, it generates JavaScript. So you get all the, all the same benefits of the Scala language as you would in other environments. But it also has full interoperability with JavaScript. So as you know, there's a lot of, lot of JavaScript libraries out there if you need left padding or some other things. There's a library for that. But there's also a lot of great JavaScript libraries for front-end development, like React or Angular and so on. And Scala.js has been designed to work with these libraries from, from the very beginning. So you don't need to do any special things, but you can actually use these libraries, call them as you would call any Scala code, just by writing some nice little facade for the JavaScript side. And the compiler is very good at optimizing your code. If you're worried about compiling from Scala, which is like very complicated compared to normal JavaScript, you don't have to worry too much. You can usually just write Scala as you would uh, write it for JVM, and the compiler will take care of all kinds of optimizations. It's actually doing a bit more optimizing than Scala C, as we will see later on. And in the JavaScript world, in front-end development, people are always worried about how big is your JavaScript size? That is, it, is it too big for, let's say, a mobile web application? But the JS code generated by Scala.js is, let's say, small enough. It's not as small as you would do it if, if you would do everything by hand, but it's small enough for, for practically all, all use cases. And finally, if we all know that Scala is not the fastest compiler around, and if you add JavaScript compiling on top of it, uh, it doesn't really get any slower. We will see soon, as, as I do some live, dem live demos, that the normal edit compile run cycle is very fast. It's about as fast as you would get by just using JavaScript uh, and, 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 and the normal JavaScript tool chain. <laughs> But let's do a quick live demo to see what it actually looks like to do JavaScript in Scala. So I'm going to be using this Scala fiddle, which originates from Scala JS fiddle created by Hao Yi, who has also done a lot of other interesting Scala JS libraries. So basically, the Scala fiddle is, is a browser application that has a server-side compiler, so you write Scala on the browser and then it compiles it on the server-side to JavaScript and then that JavaScript is actually run in the browser. So let's make some simple simple code. So you can just use normal, normal Scala code Press Control N, Control Enter it will then compile compile it on the on the server side and then the output is JavaScript, which is then run uh, in in the browser. 
So let's make this a bit. Can you make it bigger? Yes. Bigger? Can you do use source of JavaScript on the scene? I will do that. Huh? Can you use source of JavaScript on the scene? I will do that. Yeah, the JavaScript on the scene. Can you use source of the JavaScript? Well, the source source code of the JavaScript is like three megabytes, so I'm not going to show oh, it okay. here <laughs> because this is in the in the sort of fast optimized phase when it doesn't optimize the size level. We, we, we can see some some things later on, but but basically the JavaScript it creates is quite readable until you run it through the Google Closure Compiler, which sort of minifies it and then it's totally unreadable. But that's what everybody is doing in the front end world anyway. But let's let's create some actual HTML. So I'm using a library called Scala Tags, which enables you to write HTML in Scala just by defining these tags. And then I need to render it to the actual DOM element. I have this support utility class called Fiddle here, which allows me to, for example, put that element into the DOM. I also have full uh, completion, like I can write print, and then I get this. It, 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 it actually goes back to the server to ask that, what can I fill in here? And then it gets this list, this list like you would get in an IDE, and then, then you can just write, write print. And put Does it use the presentation compiler, or? Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 using the same stuff that's in Scala 2.11.8 as a new new completion mechanism. So it's basically the same as the REPL REPL is using. And uh, but let's let's add some other things here. And there is a there's a panel which is actually, as you can see, it's a div element within that output window. And in the panel, I can just use normal DOM. If you're familiar with JavaScript and DOM, you know that this DOM is built by using these app and child calls. And let's add it that way. So this is pretty similar as you would do in normal JavaScript. Let's add another text box, just an input element with a number. And let's add that one there as well. <coughs> of course, normally you would not individually add these like this, but you would build like a one div. But because I want to access that header later on, I, I want to have it in, in, my, in my variable. Then I'm going to add event listener. Going to get an event. I don't care about the event type, but within the event, so whenever that's, that's okay, so now I have this input box here that I can write something. So whenever I update the input box, this callback is being called, and then I can use use it to set the color color of the header to whatever I write there. I can also demonstrate that if, if I make some mistakes, like use the British color, which is of course a huge mistake when doing <laughs> doing uh, programming, so you, you get the error messages here very quickly and easily. So it's 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 not an IDE, but you can you can do simple stuff here quite easily. So now if I write some colors here, I can see that whenever it's a valid valid color will create, change change the color to something else. <coughs> okay, so this Scala fiddle is actually meant to be as a sort of tool for exploring Scala. So it's not just for Scala.js, but it's it's going to be a Scala Center project. So it's, it's something that you can embed on web pages. So when you have, let's say, a library and you want to document your library, you can you can bring in this kind of interactive uh, documentation that you can show some examples and let people who are reading your documentation actually experiment it with. Because this is 
uh, full, full Scala compiler in, in the back end, you can do all, all the stuff you can do normally in Scala. There are some limitations, like you can't use reflection and some other things that don't work in the JavaScript world, but otherwise, uh, it's, it's a very nice tool for for doing, doing these, these kind of simple, simple examples. I can also show you that uh, I don't have the JavaScript code, but I can see. So this is, this is actually the code. So there, there's a template uh, in this fiddle that I'm just writing in the sort of what, whatever goes into the main function. But there, there are all the normal imports and some other things wrapping wrap around this thing so that it actually makes a full full style application. You have to have that JS app there, but it actually is, is a normal JavaScript application that you can you can run here. And it also shows you that what, what libraries I'm, I'm using here. Uh, but let's look at a bit more complicated example. So So this is a Hilbert curve, if you are familiar with that. So this is just a normal plain Scala algorithm for drawing a Hilbert curve. Okay, now this is um, and then I have this loop here that every 100 milliseconds draw the next path in the curve. So I can make this a bit faster. We don't have to wait, wait for it. Okay. Something wrong. Let's reset. And this reset function after. So now it's going a bit, bit faster. So this, this is also a good way to, uh, if you consider that you are usually using like REPL and you are just generating some text output, like you get the result and the type, which is quite uh, ugly usually. But if, if you want to demonstrate some features of Scala or your library, you can also use all these kind of graphical elements uh, in, in the Scala fiddle. So this is one, one of the sort of benefits of, of having JavaScript, JavaScript support that you don't have to rely on people to download Scala, install SBT, run the REPL, then try your examples there, but you can just give them direct access on your website to try, try your library or, or your examples. And let's, let's leave that running in the background and let's go back. Back to the slides. Of course, being Google presentation, it always wants to go on it again on my presentation. I wonder if they have any kind of offline mode for this. But maybe we will just use this. Right. This is why I usually don't trust like all, all the fiddles I'm, I'm running on local host because I don't trust the network to work. But I, I haven't re figured out how to export like a local. I have a PDF as a backup <laughs> for the presentation, but let's hope we can get. Maybe you guys are just using all all the bandwidth. Yes. Okay, this is embarrassing. I think I switch to the PDF. Yeah. Okay, we are back. Let's download the PDF at this point. This thing happens next So let's look at the internals of what, what happens inside the Scala.js compilation pipeline. So this is the normal Scala compiler compilation. You have a source code, you run it through the compiler, you get a class file, which is JVM bytecode. You pass it on in, at, at runtime to JVM, and the JVM then pulls in those all, all those other libraries from jars, and then that's that's your application. In Scala.js, you start with the same same source code. Uh, you run it through the same Scala C compiler, but there is a plugin, Scala.js plugin, that actually 
instead of just generating this class file, it also generates this Scala.js intermediate representation file, which is like something that will then be converted to JavaScript later on. The idea is that when you have libraries, Scala libraries that you want to use in Scala.js, you have to have these intermediate representation files in, in the library, in the jar files. So basically you need to recompile Scala libraries so that they can be used by Scala.js because it needs these higher files in the linking phase. So this is a bit similar as, as was discussed earlier about the Doty compiler, that there is this linking phase as well. So it, instead of doing the, let's say, linking at runtime, it's done in the compiler. So everything you have, the full application is actually being built at this phase. So your code is being included, the library code is being included, and then it generates this huge JavaScript file, which is then, then your application. So this is a bit different from a normal Scala compilation cycle, but all of this is also incremental compilation. So when you make changes, it doesn't do everything again and again, but it's, it's fairly, fairly fast. As you saw with, with the Scala Fiddle example, you didn't really see much, much of a delay when changes were made in the source code. And it also does a lot of optimizations. Like if, if you had been using Scala.js like two years ago, it would be generating these huge files and it was really slow. But now it's actually doing a lot of optimizations that help, help producing very fast JS code. So the original, let's say, compilation or linking step generates this very big JavaScript file, mostly because uh, the standard library and the collections are huge. They are not modularized yet. So everything is, gets pulled in, so if you use one list, one sequence, everything in the collection library gets pulled in, resulting in this huge, huge file. Uh, but it does full program optimization, so because it knows your code, you have, have to actually tell it the entry points, and this is where my code starts. And then it will sort of go through your code and see that what, what code are you actually using and what you are not using, and then it's just removing all your unused code. So instead of, in the JVM world, when you build a normal Scala application, you usually end up with something like 30 megabytes of jar files. But in the Scala, the JS, everything, all, all the code that you are not actually actively using in your application gets removed. And this sort of results into this one, one to two to maybe four megabyte JavaScript file, uh, depending on, on the amount of libraries you are using. And this is the normal like, development time of compilation, but you don't, you don't need to optimize it any further. Now for production, you typically want to run it through Google Closure Compiler, which is done automatically by Scala.js plugin, which will then result in a very much smaller JavaScript file, which is totally, totally fine for all kinds of uses. So why is Scala.js important right now? Well, we know that front end stuff is getting complicated. If you look at the old, old stuff like 10 years ago, it was really simple. You were just producing HTML files and maybe a little bit of JavaScript to do some animations and stuff like that. But it was all on server side. Nothing, nothing important was happening on, on the client side. Then the next phase was that people realized that, hey, I can do more stuff in JavaScript. So this kind of idea of single page app was born that like Google Google uh, Gmail inbox is a sort of typical example that everything is actually happening on the browser side, but you still have these HTML templates and calling REST APIs over, over the network. And people got more greedy and they wanted to be even more JavaScript centric. So even more complicated applications were born and you were not using DOM, uh, you were not using HTML anymore, but you were using code to generate the DOM. For example, Facebook React is a typical example of, of this, this kind of library or Angular 2. So it was getting more and more complicated. You had more and more files on, 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 on the front end development and also you started using new features that were not supported by the browser. So you had to use these transpilers bubble 
or TypeScript if you wanted to introduce some types. So also the whole compilation pipeline of JavaScript world changed. It was not just you had JavaScript and you uploaded it to the browser and it was fine, but you had to go through the same compilation pipeline as you would in, in server-side programming. And then the next generation that we are now seeing is basically you have all these new languages coming up like Scala, Closure, Elm, TypeScript, that people are starting to experiment, not just using JavaScript, but, but using other, other languages as well. And sharing code between client and server. Uh, of course, the JavaScript developers want to see JavaScript on server side, so they created Node.js, but now Scala.js allows you to use the same code on server side and on client side, but it, it's instead of being JavaScript, it's actually nice, nice and clean Scala code. <laughs> And in, in a sense, JavaScript is being reduced as a sort of byte code, and they are doing these web assemblies and so on. So it's, it's more like a compiled target than a native language. It's, it's, it's not like people are writing code in assembly language these days, but you have a lot of compilers generating, generating that. So why would you want to use Scala.js instead of normal JavaScript? Well, we all know it's strongly typed to get to catch the errors at compile time. We don't need, I don't need to maybe tell you all this because you all know this already. But in the JavaScript world, you do a lot of, a lot of runtime checks because you cannot do compile time checks. You don't know the types to compile. There is no compiler, so you can't do anything there. So you need to either do a lot of testing in, in your code base just to catch errors that you would catch at compile time in other environments. Or at one time you have to verify, like, is this still valid, is this a string, is this that and that, which you don't need to do with Scala. Uh, because Scala.js is compatible with all, all the Scala libraries, except the ones that depend on Java library, because it is not going to be compiling Java code in Scala, so we have to have like a pure Scala environment, uh, except some, some Java stuff, like the normal runtime stuff, has been com converted to Scala. JS. But you also get to access all the existing JavaScript libraries, and this is a huge bonus uh, for, for development. You don't need to create all this stuff from scratch, but you can just take Facebook React, use the facade created for that, and just try, try, start writing front-end applications in Scala using, using these developing and uh, great libraries out there. And you can run the same code on server and client, which is quite useful. Especially when it comes to server client communication, you don't need to rely on just using JSON and so on, but you can do this kind of real RPC. And of course, you don't need to write JavaScript. This is, in my opinion, the biggest, biggest benefit of, of Scala.js. So let's look at the strategies. This is the sort of classic strategy of doing front end. If you have server side rendering HTML, and the browser is just is playing the HTML. This is how, how everything was done for, for a very long time. And then you get this front end being developed in JavaScript, you are using REST API, but you still have the server side in, uh, in Scala. I guess like Wix is using this kind of strategy for, for your stuff. And this is probably the mo most common one nowadays. With Scala.js, you can basically replace your front end JavaScript with Scala. And with that, you can get benefits like sharing sharing code between client and server, having a more like RPC API that you can do this. Like in the micro, in the microservices world, you can call microservices directly by using Scala uh, Scala APIs. Okay, let's look at another live demo. So this is a tutorial I made about a year ago when I was learning Scala.js myself. Uh, so it's available in GitHub, well, well documented, and it sort of demonstrates some of the typical, typical things you would do uh, in a Scala.js application. So let's look, look at the code a bit. So I'm not focusing on, on the sort of client-server communication and how it's done in Scala.js, 
Uh, the tutorial, uh, the SPA tutorial is using a library called AutoWire, also by Hao Yi, who has been super active in Scala.js. Uh, so it allows you to define an API, just a trait. You have, you have these functions, methods there, and this is, this is the API between client and server. Then on the server side, can everybody see this, or should I just give a bigger prompt? There Jake has a presentation mode. How much is there? It's not a map. Yeah, okay. So this is this is now uh, basically the implementation. So to implement this on server side, you just extend the API, just like you would normally. Nothing. You don't need to care that you are actually being called by by the client over over HTTP. So you just define define the functions, and that's that's how it goes. Then on the client side, where is my client? The one one is Okay. Now on the, on the client side to call, let's say, that get to do function, uh, we have defined an Ajax client, uh, which is basically the auto wire thing, and we tell it that okay we are using the API trait here and then it will it will actually use a macro to generate code that will then do the do the call. So you can just call call a method, you still need to do this dot call method after after that. But we, we we can see that the result result of this call is a future. So you just make a call on the client side and you get a future. Of, of the result. So when whenever the call is actually completed, then the future gets completed, and then you can do what whatever you want with it, like using using the map call to create create this update or to do. Uh, so this is the same same thing over here. We are up updating to do's with an item, so we can just pass parameters here. If I, if I make any kind of mistake here, then the compiler will compile. The compiler will complain as will the IDE. So when, let's say, when we do refactoring, which is what we always do, uh, then it affects both your client and your server. So when you change the API, which I can actually do here, let's say, let's make a mistake and let's say that this is Welcome now. Okay. And now, now we can see. It. Let's change something that we can actually see. Get to do from server. So if I change the API, I can immediately see. That, okay, this is this is now wrong. That there's there's something something went wrong. So I can just fix it fix it like that. The same thing on the on the server side. It also shows here the error. So when when you make it, this this mechanism sort of ensures that your client and server stay synchronized. So when, when you make changes to the API, it will refuse to compile the client and the server unless they are fixed uh, to whatever changes you make. And this is this is not this is not like a feature of Scala.js. This is just a library. How you create it for this purpose? It just makes it easy to do this kind of RPC. Uh, you can do it in in whatever way you want, but it's it's one of one of the good good things of Scala.js that you can actually access this kind of type safe remote calls. And this is this is like the in implementation that here the way the call is actually being done <coughs> is basically we are calling calling. Ajax host as, as a JavaScript, and we are using this uh, pickling library to create the binary binary form. So it's sending binary data to the server, and we 
receiving binary data, which is then extracted to the structure that we actually want. But this is also something you can override that if you want to use something else, if you want to use web sockets, this is, this is where you can just put it. But you can check out the SPA tutorial for more, more details. Let's get back to the presentation. It's still available, yes. Now, so Scala.js is, is a great way to do front-end uh, development on, on the browser. We've been using it for, for quite some time now successfully, and a lot of other <coughs> people and teams have been using it, and they have been very, very happy about it. Even people who have been doing JavaScript previously have been able to use Scala.js, uh, because one, one of the reasons is that Scala, in essence, is quite similar to JavaScript. It's not like, let's say, Closure Script, which is based on Closure, which is more like Lisp. It's totally different from JavaScript. So for a JavaScript developer to jump to Closure Script, it's like a huge leap because it's totally different. But you can start, just like you, many of us probably started writing Scala by just writing Java and then maybe using some of the Scala features. You can do the same thing uh, with Scala.js. If you have JavaScript developers, they can start writing Scala in a very JavaScript way, uh, and then just expand over to the more Scala-ish features over time. But now that we actually have JavaScript, it allows us to do more than just basic browser applications. We can also do front-ends for desktop and mobile. Uh, there are a couple of libraries that allow you to build native desktop, desktop, desktop apps uh, with JavaScript. There is this nw.js and Electron, uh, and they are, of course, based on, on the idea that you can run JavaScript, and, and they're using Chromium, uh, like the browser, and Node.js, uh, and to bundle, bundle all that into a desktop app. And if you're using Slack, for example, on desktop, that's a typical example of these kind of applications. And the benefit is that you can use basically all of your UI logic, UI code, both on the on the web website, but also in the desktop. So this is, instead of using, let's say, Swing or some other Scala Java library to build a desktop app, you can just use the web, web technologies quite easily. Uh, another way to do like mobile development is to use React Native, which is a, a system built by Facebook that's based on React. Uh, it's not using uh, web. Uh, DOM or anything like that. It's actually a native application on your iOS or Android phone, but it's using the same React system. It's using JavaScript uh, to control the UI. So this is another way how you can write Scala, Scala applications and just run, run them on, on mobile. There are a couple of examples of how this React Native can be used with Scala already out there. And it seems to be quite, quite easy to use. One other thing that I wanted to address is that in some cases you just want to do something quite simple and you don't want to host a server uh, to do that or, or if you want, if you're worried about scalability, uh, you really need to build a complex scalable server. How about doing web apps without any kind of server? So instead of doing this front-end server division, you can do front-end well, let's, let's say you can move more and more functionality into the front end because it's in Scala. You can just run the same code over there. And then instead of having a sort of huge server side thing, you can just use things like AWS Lambda, where you're just doing very simple calls. You're doing, doing a call, and then the Lambda will then run your code for just that one call. And then you can access some databases or so on. Or in some cases, you don't even need this, that you, you just have some functionality you want to expose, and you can do it all, all on the front end side. Let's say you have uh, some financial institution who wants to do some simulations. You can then just do those simulations on, on the front end in, in JavaScript uh, world without, without worrying about having, having a server for that. And you can even move a bit further. 
because the Lambda is, even though it supports JVM, then the startup times, startup times are not so great because loading JVM and all that thing that happens in the beginning is quite slow. But if you also compile your server-side code into JavaScript and use Node.js, then you get the benefit of, of pretty quick startup times that, and also faster execution in the Lambda. Because the Lambdas are typically very short lived calls that you call, call a function that just goes to a database, fetches some data, and maybe gives it back or something like that. So you don't need to have this huge JVM to be restarting on almost every call and so on. So this is one, one way of, of writing Scala applications and running it in JavaScript, both, both on front end and back end. I don't know if anybody has actually done that, but there, there's been some blog posts uh, about this using Lambda with Node.js running Scholar.js Scholar applications. So <clears throat> here are a couple of examples I collected of what, what kind of applications have people actually developed using Scholar.js. Uh, there's QWERTY, which is a sort of wiki, wiki kind of thing, online information tool. Uh, developed by basically one one guy already almost ten thousand lines of of code. Uh, there are a couple of other other examples. I mean, these are pretty big applications, and these are all made in the last one one year, one one and a half year. So it's it's possible to get get your team quite quickly up to speed writing writing large and complicated applications in, in Scala JS. For example, network management. Graphical UI used to be uh, like a flash flash application before, and now they have written into real real web application using Scala.js. So, in summary, Scala.js is is production ready. It's basically been production ready for the past year already, and it's it's been evolving all the time. Now the focus is moving more towards how to integrate even better with the Scala, with the JavaScript uh, libraries and the JavaScript compilation techniques. Uh, there are all these webpacks and browser files and other uh, NPMs and, and stuff like that that you have to consider when you are really integrating into the JavaScript world. But most of the compiler is, is ready. It works very well. It even supports Scala 2.12 already. Uh, so you don't need to worry about getting left left behind if if you choose Scala.js. Uh, developing is it is very nice. You can just use your normal Scala IDE, whether it's IntelliJ or Eclipse based, and all the tools work just as as, as they would otherwise. These IDEs don't really even know that you are doing Scala.js. For them, it's just normal Scala code that gets compiled. A bit differently by by the plugin in, in SVT, and I, I'm still emphasize, emphasizing this integration with the JavaScript libraries because it's very important part of this. Especially if you have a team who have been using JavaScript libraries, who have been di di building from them using those libraries, uh, then they can continue using those libraries. You don't need to step up and sort of create. A new library for just for Scala JS, but you can just keep on keep on using those existing ones and reaping the benefits of all the developments that happen happen for those libraries. For example, React, just a new version of React was just released today or was it yesterday? And we've seen that a lot of Scala libraries have been also ported to Scala JS typically. If you have a normal Scala library that doesn't have a lot of dependencies or doesn't use reflection, you just have to have enable like one plugin in your compilation uh, build build file, and then you suddenly have a Scala.js com compatible library. <coughs> so we have seen examples like Cats, Scala Z, Shapeless, Scala Test. All of these sort of let's say big mainstream libraries are already already working on Scala on, on top of Scala.js as well. And there are also a lot of libraries being built, especially especially for Scala.js use. For example, Scala tags. Uh, you you pickle Dio is Dio is one of my own libraries. AutoWire, all these things. So it's the ecosystem is is moving ahead quite 
quite nicely, and a lot of, a lot of people are publishing their libraries as, as open source. Uh, if you want to get started, just head out to the Scala.js uh, website, and we also have a video room with about 800 people there, so we just sign in there and start asking questions, and there's a lot of, lot of people willing to help you out. <laughs> you were really quick. I have two questions. First, two questions. Uh, first, I want to use NPM so I can use web of the verify uh, out of the box to support the uh, transform to SkyJS support. Uh, I want to use an NPM, for example. So, web of support using it for SkyJS. <coughs> Uh, so, using N NPM? Yes, I want to get an NPM on the internet and use it to my SkyJS code. Is it possible? Uh, not, not at the moment. So, the thing is that the compilation or the bundling phase is the problem because Scala.js uh, is basically building a single JavaScript file, which is your application, and then the dependencies are basically bundled separately into, into another JavaScript file. But the Method at the moment is that they are just in the global scope as, as they used to be a long time ago. So what, what needs to be done is basically to run another step that would then run it through these module bundles. So that the job, whatever Scala.js is producing is like one module that then gets integrated with all these other things. But the problem is that in development mode, I, I've actually tried this myself already. But the problem is that when Scala.js generates that 4 megabyte JavaScript file and you give it to Webpack, it sort of fades, does something for 10 seconds. Even if it doesn't need to do anything, it just takes 10 seconds to go through that file. So then suddenly, when you, when you are used to having like half a second compile cycle, then you have this 10 seconds extra. So we have to figure out that how to how to get around that, maybe replace these webpacks and other things with Scala.js internal bundling mechanism. But that's that's actually one of one of the, one of the big things for Scala.js 1.0 one is to get this module bundling so that you can just use the NPM libraries. Because many many of them are now only in in this module format that you don't get to get the sort of ready compiled versions anymore. Yeah. One question you were to react. And I was wondering, you get a React and write it on the client side. Do you have ability to support to write it on the server side, the React, or...? Uh, well, I think the current current version of the facade that sits on top of React, it probably doesn't work on the server side. Because basically it would need to render a string instead of a DOM. Yeah. It's, it's, it's totally possible, but I think it's currently not. For yeah. SEO and so on, SEO views and so on. So, yeah. because you know what we're doing it, so. Not yeah, yeah, but that's that's something that's being discussed quite quite often on the GitHub channel. That it's it's a known known issue, and but it's just that this there's this one Australian guy who is doing the React facade, Scala.js that's React, and he's working on his own project as well, and he's like one guy doing all of this on his own. So it's. It's, it's not a top priority for him at the moment. But there are some other React facades as well. But you're not running anything on the server side with JavaScript, only a scanner, and you produce a file. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, like that's all the running or something. No, 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 there's okay. nothing, nothing, no, no JavaScript is needed, except when running tests on yeah. the server side. Then you typically run the tests in Node or the Scala JS. Like Can you show example of tests if you have a Okay, but no, well, well, but I mean, the tests are the same as, as in, you can run the same, for example, in, in my library, you can, it's, it's one set of tests, you run the same tests on JVM and on JavaScript using the load. Let's take over there first. Okay. It's even easy to debug the runtime, for example, what about source maps? Yeah, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that the Scala.js compiler produces source maps, so you can actually do debugging in, in Chrome DevTools just like you would do with Elm or TypeScript or one of these other 
other uh, transpiled languages. So it's it's not, of course, the debugger is not as powerful as in your IDE, but it's it's good enough. And usually you don't really need to do that much debugging. It's not like in JavaScript you have to do a lot of debugging because everything happens in runtime. In Scala you have that compiler taking care of most most of the problems, and you don't. For example, I I, I very rarely need to do any debugging with Scala or JS. Just saying. Oh, okay. Over there. Yeah. Hi. So. Very quickly, the ecosystem is really big. We have tons of libraries of different kinds. And when you look at the signature, you know absolutely nothing of input or of types. Mm -hmm. What is the common approach of integrating stuff with Scala.js? Because that's why the JS is full. Cool. But when you try to integrate, I see just a big mess of matches. Yeah, yeah. Pieces. Yeah, so one, one approach is that because a lot of libraries nowadays have uh, TypeScript definition out there, uh, so you can. There's a tool that generates Scala JS facade from a TypeScript definition. It doesn't. It works like let's say 95, 98 percent. So you still have to do some fiddling with the code. But basically, you, if, if you have a TypeScript definition, then you can use that to bootstrap your Scala JS facade development. If, if not, then you have to go and look at the code. Or, well, there are, because you don't need to do a facade. If you want to be on type safe, uh, then you can use the dynamic typing in, in Scala as well. But you're just writing like JavaScript, but the compiler, if everything is fine with the compiler. It, it just generates similar JavaScript then as an output. You don't get any type, type well, checks or anything. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's a good way to sort of start to just experiment with something, and then when you get when you get that working, then you can build the facade when you know the types and so on. And also, if you have a complex, let's say, uh, for example, in my tutorial, I'm using this chart.js uh, library, which has a lot of different charts. But you don't need to build facade for all of them. You can just cherry pick. I I, I need a line chart. I need a bar chart. So I I just basically wrote facades for those features that I need. And a lot of these facades have actually been developed like this, that you just start with the features that you need, and then you can go and inspire over time. There was My question is also about server-side rendering. Uh, maybe is there any library except Graph to, to uh, have an ability to render on server-side? Do you know some examples? Uh, yeah, for example, the Scala Tax library that I was using in, in the example has server-side rendering. So in, on, the, on the client side, when you call render, it generates a DOM tree. But on the server side, when you have exactly the same code and call render, it generates a string of HTML that you can then export. And basically the same thing would be would happen with, with the React as well. But I think that with the React, there is just some minor things that would need to be changed for it to be able to react, to, to be able to render uh, on the server side as, as HTML. But for example, the Scala text library was originally created for server side rendering. And then second phase was the client side stuck with Scala.js. So it's, it's definitely possible. Anything else? Those those type annotations or type wrappers we need to write in order to uh, use in order to use uh, JavaScript libraries. Do they add any kind of uh, performance or space penalties in them? No, the facades are transparent in that sense that they are like compile time only, and when when you when the JavaScript is being created, it doesn't do any any type checking or anything like that. At that, at that phase. Of course, when you are doing Scala code, you still have those, let's say, pattern, pattern matching. There is still some runtime checks. But with, with, with the JavaScript plus library facades, there is not, nothing. It's, it's as performant as, as it should be. Yes? Uh, what about for browsing? Hmm? Uh, what about for browsing? Uh, if you read some JavaScript, 
is it uh, modern or ES5 script? Uh, it's ES, ES5 compatible. Uh, so the Scala.js generates JavaScript that's compatible with the advanced mode of Google Closer Compiler. So the Google Closer Compiler can really compress and optimize everything um, size-wise and it will generate an ES, ES5 code. There are some features, for example, you can use promises and other ES6 features, but there have been experiments of, of because there is a mode for generating ES6 code out of, out of Scala.js, but usually it doesn't make sense because it performs that browsers, I mean the ES6 implementation in most browsers is still quite so it works, but it's it's not performant. So if you want good performance, you should still, even in writing normal JavaScript, you should still use Bubble to compile it to JavaJ ES5 because it performs much better for, for now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.